Yeah. No, I have it. Well, it's just after to start, Tommy might make the start, so good morning everybody. Good morning. Um, and welcome to our monthly meeting, and of course it's our um, annual general meeting. <coughs> Um, so firstly, um, I'd like to welcome all our members, and um, we have any guests here today? Ben McGrath, Ben Brown, thank you. It's great to see you. Ted Green is here. Yeah, and Ted Green is here again today, morning too. Um, are there any apologies that we may have? Gary Papworth. Gary Papworth. In South Australia. South Australia. Yes, he is. He's been committed there. Noel Griffith. John Griffith. Noel Griffith, thank you. John what we'll Perry. do is um, uh, we'll go through a roll call in a minute. We'll <clears throat> just confirm that we do we do have a, have a quorum. We'll go through that now. Okay, so. Um, in pole position, Mr. Rob Adams. Dr. Peter Bedford. Yeah. Thank you. Noel Benson. Bert Berryman. Yes. Morning, Bert. Bruce Brazant. Yes. Hector Davis. Michael Doherty. Myself. Len Edwards. Yes. Robert Herbacker. Not all here. Partly here. <laughs> Alan Evans. Present. Morning, Alan. Brian Fitt, Nick Francis is an apology, he's up north. Noel Griffith. Apology. Frank Henning. Apology. Thank you. Dr. Bob Hill. Apology. Next up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Deputy Pinks. Yeah, yeah. Dr. John Horsfall. Present. Reg Jackson. David Jones is here. Present. Dr. Joe Lansberg. Yep. David Lane. And David's an apology. He's coming later. Yeah. Jerry Mazzoletti. Brian McMahon. John Metcalf. Yep. Gary Nodo. Gary Patworth is an apology. Uh, John Parry Jones. Apology. Thank you. Um, Graham Ratton. Yep. Kevin Ryan. Yeah. Morning, Kevin. Will Semwa. Absolutely. Well, well done. Good morning, Will. Ron Spreachley. Apology. Thank you. Colin Stiles. Uh, David Taylor. Morning, David. Liv Serling. Yeah. Yes, Liv. Keith Tupper. Livio Turacek. Apology for Keith. Thank you. Andy Walsh. He's coming later with the speaker. Thank you. Ian Williamson. Okay, um, I hope I haven't missed anybody. I can confirm we need 25%, so we have a quorum for this morning. Yep. Okay. Um, the minutes of the uh, 2023 AGM um, have been previously provided, I think, Mary, with the newsletter. Um, can we um, take it that those minutes have been read? And if that is the case, we need a, um, somebody to move them and second them. I'll move them. Thanks, David. Thank you. And thank you, John Metcalf. Um, are there any business arising from those minutes? Okay. Um, <clears throat> item six on the agenda is that any correspondence, uh, particularly addressed to the AGM. Uh, I'm not aware of any Colin. I've not really call? accepted the um, constitutions in evolution for purpose. Yeah. yeah did, did everybody hear that? There's, no. there's a review of the constitution of Crovis overall, we're simplifying it, and that's in Crovis. It hasn't been finalised yet. So, interim documents <coughs> are going to be circulated to everybody soon. Yeah. Might be long. Might be long. That's true. The <laughs> annual report, um, thanks to Colin, thank you, Colin, has been prepared by, by Colin. 
um, and on behalf of the committee, it's been provided also with the newsletter. Um, you might take it there, it's been read, Colin. Is there any, anything particularly you want to speak about in relation to that? Just, just to thank the retiree major contributors, David Lund and Bert Berryman, for their major contributions, and thank you both to them. President and the committee and all of the club members for their contribution. <clears throat> thanks, Colin. And uh, particularly thanks to yourself and also to Bruce for the work we've been doing the last yes, 12 months. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Now, a round of applause for Bruce, too. I'll, I'll move that the report be received. Thank you, David. And sec second, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Robert. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, reports on other activities as Bruce, um, Bruce, but um, you've um, managed to keep us in the black. Yes, we seem to be okay. Um, we've been helping I think. I might mention on the where I've got sundries, thousand thirty-four. That's in fact includes two hundred and twenty-four for um, equipment rent and three hundred and one for equipment rent. And 162 for equipment. That's most of the sundries. So I, I was a bit of a big number for sundries, but that's a great deal. I wondered about that. I thought you had not a casino. Someone told me they saw you walking along South Bank. No. Is that not true? No, it was a part of my losing it. So. <laughs> how, many years, how many years have you been? Oh, only about six or seven. Oh, right. Okay, just getting used to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. But if you get the family to help me now, so I had to give it away. No, you've done some wonderful service, um, and thanks very much indeed. Thank, thank you, yeah. uh, Mr. I'll, I'll move that the treasurer's report be received. Thank you. And I think Graham Ratton put his hand up in relation to that. Thank you. Um, not sure we've got any other particular reports. Uh, to receive Gary, Gary's away. Gary, um, give him a vote of thanks for uh, the work that he's been doing. He's stepping away in a, in a, in a fashion, as I understand it, as activities um, person. Um, he's been doing it for quite a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah magnificent effort. And uh, I'd like to record my thanks and committee thanks to him for the, all the work that he's, he's done. He will continue to work for us. Um, the bigger external trips, such as liaising with Group 4, as I understand, he's, he's still keen to um, help us out in that regard. But the, the many trips, I like to call it, that he wants to step away from that. And I think as a committee that we've decided that we'll try and lean on all the members and, and amongst ourselves and come up with some ideas about um, where we'd like to go and, and uh, put it to the members. But uh, really, um, Gary's been such a force in, um, getting those, those trips together, we're going to miss him. So um, to keep it moving, we're going to have to rely on everybody to come up with some ideas about um, what you'd like to do. So if we spread the load, it, uh, it should be easy in theory. We'll see how it works in practice. <clears throat> um, if there's no other reports, um, I think we discussed the committee, Colin, setting an annual membership fee. Yes, that's true. It's fixed on sixty dollars. Sixty dollars. Um, hope that that's not going to break the bank for everybody. But um, this time of capitation fees and so forth, um, there is a need to bump it by. I think it's was fifty five dollars though. Yeah. So sixty dollars. So expect that. So um, I'll, I'll move that the the fee for, for this year be sixty dollars. Thank you. Second. Thanks, Brian. The appointment of a returning officer uh, for the election of a management committee. Um, the nominations have been received. Um, Should we have a vote on the. When we have the vote for the uh, fee increase? Yeah, both. We just voted. We just had it. We just had it? Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, no, one jumped, no, one, no one jumped up and said no, so it was, it's unanimous. Okay, nice. so my hearing's a bit off, I'm sorry about that. Someone will have to check your super balances, but anyway, I think hopefully you're okay. Yeah, if you like, you need a line. Yeah, so, yeah. 
Now, upon our returning officer, Colin or Doug, do we normally lean on someone to do that? Well, I'll be here back as the returning officer. Right. And he's organised the call. Mem membership. And he's got the, well, either he or Colin have got the nomination forms. I think, um, yeah, I'm not sure why I'm all the way from here, but they're on that table there. No, I think Colin's got it. Have you gone, Colin? I've got many forms here. So perhaps. We'll uh, Colin can announce that the nominations have been received. Yes. Uh, I'll we'll go to my class case here, Tom. Yes, here, you had it. There you are. Okay, under Alexander McCall's Smith book. Okay, we have in big writing here Robert Urbacher as one of the committee members, the member. Membership manager, Robert Urbacher. Uh, another person, the secretary treasurer, and it's called Superman, so we've got him. Alias <laughs> Colin Stiles. We've got newsletter and webmaster and general genius, Bruce Present. that's another one. Yep. <laughs> yes. That's three. Right. And then we have in illegible writing, David Jones, PPVP. That's very impressive. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have another one here. For the term of his natural life, <laughs> John Doherty, President. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky John. Oh, here we are. Another one. And of course, Elman Historian. And an all rounder, Graham Rat. Yep. There, that's, that's the team of six. One, two, three, four, five. That's it, six of them. They're the nominations. Um, if there are no other nominations, um, we'd love more. For the floor, we, um, Andy Walsh, who was coming with John Don and our speaker, and he's decided um, to. Uh, relinquish his role as a greeter, so mm -hmm. per se we don't have a greeter as such. Um, and Nick Francis has um, got sort of family, some family issues, uh, particularly up north in um, Cairns, he's got uh, children, grandchildren up there, he's going to be spending a lot of time up there trying to help them recover from the floods and so forth, so he uh, just doesn't have the time, he wants to remain with us as a member when he's back in Victoria, but he just finds it impossible to um, be on remain on the committee of management as the vice president so our loss i think and um in passing i think those two fellows for their work in the last 12 months <clears throat> insofar as election and um, induction of those the management committee members um if it's if it's no one else um ordinarily david but to by acclamation or um the show of hands or oh, i think you just yeah, yeah, declare them elected just we can be claim, claim elected. Um, not, I'm not sure about me, uh, the term of my natural life. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, but I think, John, what, what it does uh, illustrate a point that I think we need to think about. And my understanding is that this is not just a problem for us. There was a bill that came down from <coughs> Progress Headquarters recently which uh, <coughs> indicated that a lot of clubs were having difficulty in filling community management uh, and they were encouraging the clubs to be in touch with headquarters to get assistance on this. But it, it's obvious we've got this problem. And I mean, fellas, we've got to understand we haven't got a community management we can't run this club. Full stop. Doesn't mean to say that we have to fill every position that we can have, but certainly you don't have a president, you don't have a secretary, you don't have a treasurer. And, and Bert did a fabulous job and understandably can't continue as treasurer. Now we have no one else to step in. Now, and our superman over there, in typical fashion, put up his hand and said, Well, I got electronic banking, I'll look out the treasurer's position. Not sure what that means, but anyway, <laughs> he's going to look after the treasurer as well as secretary. Now, <clears throat> I'm past president. We haven't got a vice president, so I said I'll I'll take on both the vice president. But that doesn't mean that at some stage like, that I will take on presidency. So we have to have people come forward. I understand completely that nearly everyone in this room has been through the cycle before in terms of members of the committee of management 
and um, you know, there's a limit to how many times you want to do it. But we do have to face up to the reality that if we want this club to continue, just to continue the park from thriving, we've got to be able to fill premium management positions. And we just can't keep rotating the same people. Which does bring into focus again the widening of the membership. And I would expect that committee, this new committee of management will be bringing forward fairly soon uh, something in relation to widening the membership for the members to consider and vote on. But, but we do have to face up to the fact that as a run this club, we've got to have a committee of management where we've got to have certain positions filled. Uh, and if we don't, we can't, as, as a matter of law, we can't run it unless we have a certain positions filled in a committee of management. Because someone's got to take responsibility, it's an incorporated association. There are statutory requirements and positions have to be filled. So we just need to understand that. Uh, we've got to, I'm sure the new committee is going to run things a bit differently, the way the committee of management operates. So we share the load. <coughs> but we do need to be looking ahead in terms of sustainability as far as the community management is concerned. Because if we can't sustain it, we can't sustain it. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, David. Well, that well and truly addresses the elephant in the room. Uh, and um, I think what well, well, well understood what Doug just said, it's just stating the obvious. So, um, but the committee will be leaner, but um, we'll uh, hopefully we move in the right direction for our members and uh, and get on with it in the next 12 months and see what we come up with. <coughs> All right. Um, are there any other matters that members want to address this morning before the general meeting closes? If that's not the case, I'll close the meeting now. Um, what we're waiting now is um, John Dynan to um, arrive with Andy, Andy Walsh. He'll get here about 11. We could have the first part of the general meeting now. <coughs> Um, much of what we might decide in the general meeting is um, it's already been covered by I'd like to give a blurb then, if that's okay with you. That's fine. Give a, give a blurb. So come you. up, come up, so welcome here. Yes, up, up again. Bruce, oh, okay. can, Bruce can pick it up too. Oh, right, good, thank you. 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 Thank you can put two of these on at once. Does that make sense? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, look, I, I just came to tell you a little bit about um, the Maribyrnong River Cruise. As you know, it's going to be on the uh, 23rd of April, that's a Tuesday. It's 50 bucks a head. Uh, you, we stop at the uh, boathouse, which is on the Maribyrnong, and it goes for about two hours from. We leave you at 9.30 at Bundura Park and go from 10.30 to about 12.30, have lunch and come back to party at about 2.30. It's really good. The boat's booked for 30, and that's the max number, and there's a bus that will take 24. At the moment, we've got 12 people, um, and we could perhaps have a few more with some carpooling, but 24 is what we really like. So 12 are booked in. That's me and my wife and Joe and Diane and Pat and John and... Michael and Margaret and Gary and John and Gina and Margaret Henning, but I'll leave this outside. Pop your name down if you're interested. What I need to know is whether we get at least our 24 and then I'll open it up to the other memberships of um, Olive Weagle Progress or the Rosanna Progress and that sort of thing. So let me know today if you want to come and I can then open it up and make sure we get a full attendance. It should be really interested. I hope you're a member's corner before the trip that would describe some of the important history, like Coot Canal, the munitions work, pipe thing, and even the overall history of Melbourne is, early Melbourne is really in this vicinity. So thank you very much. Colin, for you there, can you ask, just, Colin, yeah. can you just ask Rob if you speak about the, the oh, Russian? Oh, yeah. 
Well, don't give the blow for going to the Russian church. <laughs> were they great architects? I think they were, weren't they? Oh, this is complicated. <laughs> I won't be talking too long, but <laughs> go for it. Just like this here. You seem very something. Morning all. You look very different behind all this wire and stuff. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to mention on the 24th of uh, March, we've got a tour of the Russian Orthodox Church in uh, East Brunswick. Uh, it's a very classic place with gold sort of turrets and everything on it there. Uh, I've known the priest for probably the best part of 30 years. He's a, he's a great man and uh, he's very happy to take you on a little bit of a tour around the place, explain it, explain some of the history and all that. Uh, we'll have to have the off on or off button to turn him off in the end, I think. But uh, anyway, that's the plan. It's on the 24th at 11 o'clock. And if you see me down there, or I'll have a piece of paper, a clipboard, put your name down, and I'll let you have the address and everything. So uh, it would be a very interesting out here, not not far away. So you're all welcome. Thanks, Robert. We're having a short break, folks. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a short break. Andy's arrived uh, with our uh, guest speaker, and uh, we'll just have a short break. We'll get them set up, and then we'll be back into it. Go, John. I can either do one of two things. I can give you a thingy. I can use my own laptop. Yep. Or I've got an HDMI cable to the data projector. Well, I'll give you that. Ah, right up. It's on there if you want. Right up. Yeah. Can, can you do it from your laptop or yeah. you want to do it from there? Okay. okay. So what's easy for you? We can do it from your laptop. You can use your laptop. <laughs> We've got this HDMI cable. We can do that too. We'll take it straight from that. Alright, that'll go, that'll go on there. You're absolutely right. You always got to say have a good day with these things. We'll do it from the Careful, I'll take that out. I'll get you to take that over. Go very gently and I'll make sure we don't lose it. Um, I'll just connect it over up here for you. Which will go on to our website. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is. Put it aside. You can check it out. Yeah, I think so. You got to... <laughs> <laughs> 
Andy, come over here. Come over. Andy. So, so Andy can get, get to Andy. Yes, sir. So, so Bruce can, you'll have to get over here. Cuddle up to John. Yeah, okay. Cuddle up to John. Cuddle up to John. Yeah, John. Righto. Okay. We right? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to introduce John Dynan. Johnny Dynan's a local boy. He grew up in Rosanna. And my brother, Nicholas, went to school with his brother. Peter Dynan, the parade boys. Uh, John attended St Martin of Tours Rosanna, the primary school down here. He then went to Alfington Parade, Junior Parade we call it. Mm -hmm. And then he went to Parade College Bundurit where he was very successfully captain of the athletics team. And he was also school captain. <coughs> and uh, John's had a wonderful athletics career. He won the stall gift in 1980. And then he would also went on to be in the Commonwealth Games, and he's very successful. At one stage, John was rated the fourth fastest man in the world. Wow. Two, I so I'll let you, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you, uh, I'll All let right. John tell you that. Away we go. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. First of all, thank you for letting me come here. I normally don't talk about this sort of stuff anymore, and I only really think about it if you know, when people talk to me about it. Um, which 
happens all the time actually, but I um, the stall gift is a big part of my life and Andy asked if I'd come here and just talk about what I've done, so I thought I'd be happy to now. I'm not sure everyone knows about the stall gift, but it began in 1878 and it started off by a group of gold miners, because you probably know Stall was a gold mining town, very popular, and they're still ripping gold out of the ground there, but in the gold rush days, uh, there was lots and lots of people up there um, doing their luck for gold. And on around Easter time, obviously they go to mass on Sunday, and there's bugger all else to do on the public holidays. So they got together and they thought, we might as well have a foot race. Um, and the first stall gift was in 1878, and I think the first prize was a couple of pigs. But <laughs> <laughs> it was. Um, the stall gift is run over 130 yards originally, and, the, and that's called the Sheffield Distance. In pro athletics, 130 yards is a Sheffield Distance, and it's in all pro races around the world. And the reason why 130 yards became the distance was because in Sheffield in England, there were two pubs. And the doors of those pubs were 130 yards apart. <laughs> so what they would do, they'd say, look, let's race up to the next one. And they said, time each other. And that's, that's the enigma. So that's how the race began. It's a great distance because if you run a centimetre race, it's far too short for blokes like me. I, someone like me had very, very good top speed, but I could maintain the speed all the way. It took a while to get the top speed. So 70 metres, I couldn't care about that. It was too short for me. Same with 100 metres. But I started to be... One third is about my distance. Um, so these days, though, it's a metric distance of 120 metres. Um, the stall track, if anyone's ever been up there, and now the blocks now at the start, if you look up, it's a three and a half foot rise. So that's a big rise to go up a hill when you're running fast. And I'll talk about that later. It's, it, it is the number one race, pro race in the world. And recently, it's been recognised by the IAAF, which is the International Athletic Amateur Athletic Federation, as a world-class race. So it ranks now with all those international races you see going on in Europe. Still, you've seen that there. Um, I always find it a great reflection of Australian culture because of the handicap system. There's bookmakers there, um, uh, so therefore it's, it's handicapped just like the Melbourne Cup is. Whereas in Melbourne Cup, they use weights. In pro athletics, they use distance, so people have marks. And the good thing about it is you need to put in the champion's performance to win it, even if you are off eight metres and someone's way back there. You, know, you might not have the same God given ability, but you need to dig deep, train hard, set goals, and, and blast through. I think it's a great reflection of our culture, pro, pro running. As I said, betting's a big part of it, and um, there's been lots of skullduggery about the betting that's still here too. <laughs> Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. 1933, we're in the middle of the Great Depression, everyone's scratching for a quid. And a young bloke called Golden Heath from uh, Wary, which is right near the Gandhi. No, Golden Heath, yeah. Well, Golden was a young bloke, he kept himself very quiet, which is what you do. He goes up to school, um, his back has put an absolute monty on him. And the book market makers realise if Golden Heath wins a school here for worse stuff. <laughs> He's going to break the lot of us. They couldn't lay him off. So as he's walked off, so he ran his head on the Saturday, absolutely killed him. As he's walked off, a couple of the bookies connections had a chat to him and there was a shotgun involved. And he was told if he won, he was going to get blown away. So Golden got raced away. And they, they said, we know where you're staying as well. And they did. So Golden got raced away to some property somewhere. No one saw him again. He came back to the track. Um, on the Monday, an hour before the semi-final, warmed up, ran, ran away, came back to the final, warmed up, ran, collected, pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was Ed's life friend. Scott Antlich is another example. Of good, this, this, is a, this is the best I've heard. I was there that day. Scott Antlich in 1987 was um, in the semi-final at Stall, uh, was leading and he did his hamstring. And he didn't, he didn't win, so he, he was off. The next year he comes back and he was, you know, he was touted to win it. Um, he ran a very, very good heat and he was, he was in the semi-finals. And um, little, because Scott was from Sydney, little do we know he had a twin brother, right? <laughs> so back in, um, back in 88, the betting in him was a fairly big win. So Scott's twin brother 
walk through the bedroom we can have before the semi-finals, after someone that said Scott's done his hamstring again, just walk through the bedroom ring with sucking on a Marlboro cigarette, <laughs> drinking a can of VB, <laughs> and hanging a, uh, he had a, a, a hamburger in one hand, just walk past the bush, he's just going like that, and just got the wind and put his arms out <laughs> like this. <laughs> of course, Scott's, Scott's connection then went straight back, put more money on Scott, and bang, bang, one. So, <laughs> picks them right up, which is good. And that's what the school gets all about. That's the list of the winners. Um, up to 2015, to start the case. If you look at the first one, W.J. Miller, 1878. <coughs> if you look at 1997, do you point to 1997 there, Henry? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Miller no, just said. Dean Miller. That's his great great grandson. And that's wow. never been done before. Fantastic. W.J. Miller, I think, fathered his last child when he was 75 years old. So he had a bit of spark in him, I think. The bloke in 1919, Andy, can you point that? 19. Yep. Yeah. H.W. Evans. Yep. So when I won mine in 1980, I met him. He was, he was uh, um, clearly, he would have been about 25 or 26 at the time he won it. So he's a you know, fairly old bloke. Um, so I met him, he's a really nice old gentleman, as we all are. So that's a bit of a list of winners. Now my old coach, when I was 17 years old, my, I said to my dad, look, I want to have a run at school, blah, blah, one minute. So he knew that was a butcher and he was driving around and saw this bunch of guys training me. And Monty Hurst was the coach. Now he was a very experienced old guy. He was, I don't know, he'd never disclosed his age. Um, I reckon he was born around 1910, but he was up and active in, um, in the Depression. He was a boxer and he used to box at a place called the White City. I've got no idea what the White City is, but Monty told me it was around um, West Melbourne somewhere. And it was a fairly big stadium and there was boxing there. And Monty used to, you know, he was very good at it. He was in you know, shape like when I was, uh, you know, I was in the 20s and he was probably in his 70s. He, he was still very, very quick. Um, but John Wren, do you know about John Wren? You've heard about him, power that good. He came out after one of Monty's fights and said he wanted to back him and get him up for the world championships. But Monty said, look, He's married and you know, all that sort of stuff. So he said, no, I can't do it. And he wanted to concentrate on pro running. And he was also a pro runner at the time. And, um, they used to have Wednesday meetings in this white city place. And Monty was a sort of bloke who used to have a real red hot crack at whatever he did. He told me one day, he, during the Depression, his wife had, you know, she had the, the rent money in a jar, she had the housekeeping money in the jar, she had all the stuff ready for the next month. On the way to the track, I grabbed grab his housekeeping money. <laughs> he grabbed a whole lot and went down and put himself on, on the nose to his head. And he said, if he had a loss, they got two of that arm. But he won. And that was the sort of bloke he was. During World War II, he didn't go to the war. He was very thankful. He was in aircraft production down at Fisherman's Bend. Um, he said, he told me one story once, they, they were building Australia's first bomber. And he said the unions got involved and he came a job for the boys. He said the quality of work was pretty poor. And he said, you know, the big day turned out for when the bomb was going to take off. He said the brass band was there, the politics were there, and Monty was thought this thing ain't been built right. So as they fired the engines up, take them off, done a right hand bank and blew up. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And he then Monty turned his hand to manufacturing furniture, which he, which he did. Um, he trained lots and lots of winners. Um, you know, he he um, he told me once you could you used to go to the school gift and make enough money from the betting to buy a house. You know, it was that big years ago, and um, Monty used to used to do secret trials, or he would do secret trials before races to make sure he time to go and make sure it's running on time. Beforehand, he'd always look around and make sure there was no spies there, but then take his marker. And he, he used to catch something and he said once, I mean, if he caught, caught him, he dealt with him hard. So kind of like he tarred and fed it, which is pretty damn hard thing to do to man. So one day he said, he got, he got after a window stall, he had his money in a money map around, his, around here. And he had that much of a wad, he tripped, fell over and broke through the ribs. So <laughs> must have been a good bet. Um, in the Great Depression, 
you know, it was pretty hard. He was running away to Earl one day and he, um, he, he, he did have a car, so he hitches his way from home and he's lived in Fitzroy. So he's up there hitching a ride on the probably the Hume Freeway or the highway back there. And he got a, a ride on the back of a tip truck and in the truck was a load of sand. So he's buried himself in the sand and driven up to Wayne around on Friday night. And when he got there, he just walked to the Arvind River and slept on the bank. And uh, the next day he got up after probably a, it was a pretty poor night's sleep and he, he ran his race, which was good. But he was a great family man, loved Australia. Look, pretty much the values of that time. Absolutely loved Australia to death. He shot some if they had a cursed place. So if he was around today, he'd be very busy, wouldn't he? Um, he loved hard work and loved the truth. You know, he had to tell the truth always and he defended the truth. And he used to fight for everything. He's a real scrapper and one of those guys I wish was around now in our parliament because I reckon he needs some help. So that's me, believe it or not, in the yellow. And uh, that's Monty on the right. That's just after I won the gift, so um, there's Monty there. And the guy behind me uh, is a guy called Peter Marks, who's a real great friend of mine. He, um, Blonde haired, blue eyed superstar of pro running. He once used to call himself Paul Newman of professional running. <laughs> and he used to behave like that too. He was a good guy. He uh, sadly died. Um, he was only 50. He was a, he was a, uh, a plumber who got electrocuted at work. And then a couple of days later, for a run, and his heart stopped and down he went. And they said, if it was a, a bad about those fibrillated things, because yeah, the, the autopsy said he had a body of a 30 year old. So just bad luck. He was a hell of a nice bloke. So training with Monty Hurst was particularly hard. Um, it was probably the hardest training I've ever done, very old fashioned. So six days a week, after work on Sunday morning. Sunday morning was particularly difficult, particularly for someone like Mark. So Peter Mark would come to work, I'd come to training, smelling of alcohol, and I could see it coming out of his ear, I'd be like, so Monty tried to break him every Sunday, but he never did. Um, now, my first run at school was in 1978, so I'm 18 years old in 1978. Most 18 year olds would be you know, rush a beach and think they won't get shot, and I was one of those hunters. So I go up to school, I run the 70 metres and the novice 100 metres, and they're absolutely pole axed. And I thought, this isn't going to be easy. And one of the blokes was fat too, you know. I thought, how can I do this? And how am I going to improve? Because these guys aren't in the main game, these guys aren't the guys out to be. But you know, you train hard and you focus. And in 1979, I won the 100 metres at school, which is Bill Howard Handicap. 1981, the gift, and 81, I won the back markers off scratch. So I was 21 years old and I won three races up there. I, um, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, in fact, it hasn't been done, hadn't been done before like that. Um, I got up to there in 1982 for the gift heat, and on 6 to 4 run, off 6 to 4 on on a Friday. So we were unhappy. Someone had broken and he's taken our market off us and didn't know who it was. Although I did suspect someone. I wouldn't tell Monty because Monty had killed him. So <coughs> I, I didn't tell anyone. But, um, so my, Monty said to me, look, come down the track group Friday afternoon with your blocks and just pretend and then do a few breaks and then pretend you've got a bit of a crook leg. So I duly did what I was told. And Monty told one bloke, he's shaking his head, and he said, look, what a pity, he's flying. But he's got a crook car. I don't think he'll run the heat. So the next day I'm 10 to 1. <laughs> so, beautiful. yeah, beautiful. So we put all that money on. And I go bang, bang, bang. I won the heat scene quite, quite, quite easily, which is good. Um, and that's the. That's me going to them. Uh, the tape there. So the guy on the far right, does anyone know who that bloke is? Um, you probably don't. George McNeil? Oh, yes. The Scotsman? Yeah. Oh, the fine Scotsman. Now, George, George had tried to install 10 times. He came over from Scotland for 10 years. Hell of a nice bloke, George. Um, I saw him last year after he'd be, maybe, he'd be 30, he was 34 when he won it, no, man, one. So he's probably 40. So he's mid 70s now. I had to help him on the track. We, all, all the ex-winners, we, we, we wind up there for the final man. And I had to help George walk there now. But he has got a new hit, so he's going to George, um, he won the unique double. He won the gift in 1980 on the 100th run. And he won the Powerball gift in Scotland on its 100th run. So he won both centenary gifts. 
Um, he was a world champion uh, sprinter, world class, and he won a few world championships. But you know, he played soccer, one game of soccer for a professional club when he was a young bloke, and they branded him a professional, could never run out of them. Trained by um, a bloke called Wilson Young, who trained Alan Wells. Do you know Alan Wells? Is? Yeah, he won the Olympic gold medal for the Um Wilson, Wilson puts George in his category. That's how good George was, unfortunately. Next bloke on my left is Gary Gray. I ended up training with Gary. Gary's a country boy. If he comes down to Melbourne, might play football, play for North Melbourne. Might play some cricket, play district cricket as a champion for Northcote. Might have to do, some good, do athletics, make two school year finals. So he's one of those guys who turn his, um, his hand in it. He'd also smoke a pack of fags a day, not worry about it. Um, and it's impossible to eat a pie in your ruts. If you get the hottest pie in the world, you just put it straight down and beat us. I don't know how to do it. The next guy is Andy Moore. He's Peter Moore's brother. He's the younger brother of Peter Moore. Um, so he was another bloke on the other side of Adrian Linford, who's a bloke I was trying to years later. He had a big nose and called him Cleaner. <laughs> so he's a good guy. Um, after a few, about 1983, I. Up at going as far as I could with my hair. So, Neil King, who's a younger trainer, and he had an awesome running group, he, um, he asked me to join in, which I did. Um, he had learned coaching from Wilson Young in Edinburgh, as I said before, he coached down the world. So, we didn't use any weights at all, we um, used speedball and body weights um, based training, and it was, um, a, it was a superior way to train for athletics. I improved out of sight. Uh, Neil was great to be around. He, he actually had the ability to make you all sit up and feel tall. Um, and he, he used to get into your mind and, and you know, set massive goals and work hard to achieve. He was a fantastic bloke. Um, he ended up, he helped George really know it out. He won it. And Neil um, trained full school here for 10 years. So he's very, very good. He's a loss for athletics now, yeah? So he could have done a lot more. A lot of the jokes in Neil told, you couldn't tell these days. Um, unfortunately, that's himself and Neil on, obviously, the tracking. Um, that's Neil on the right. Uh, that was somewhere in Edinburgh when we were doing a training. I don't think I was training too hard, but I think I had runners on there, so it's a bit of a show for the newspapers, I think. Um, so, as I said, we, we knew, Neil particularly knew um, Alan Wells. Um, Alan, so we're talking about 1983, 84, and so Alan was at the height of his race. He was the running Olympic champion, and he used to get in the amateur world about ten thousand bucks a race. And we go, hey, I said, how does, how does that work? No, I'm not allowed to win anything. I'm whatever. So at least get paid expenses in the, in the amateurs. So you know, you might go, my fly to Melbourne, or Sydney, or well, in his case, you know, Edinburgh to London. Stay at a hotel, run a rest, go home, put 10,000 bucks of expenses in and get paid. Not bad. So we sort of said to this guy, it's not right, but well, it's a bit archaic that we have this professional and amateur stuff. So Chris Perry, myself, and Chris Perry is a local trainer, he won the 82 silver gift. Um, and Neil King, we made approaches to the amateurs and say, can we run in the amateurs? And they, they, they sort of, dismissed this as being second rate. The amateur view was these pros couldn't really run properly, you know, because if they couldn't run properly, they would never become a pro, because why would you? You couldn't run for Australia. So I, Nick, Chris and I went, we get agitated, the newspapers go on to Judy Gilda Davies, and she used to write the paper, and Peter Stone in the Herald, they used to get, and so they, they kicked up a big stink, so the amateur athletics in Australia said, okay, so you can run to the Victorian level, and that's it. I thought we'd go away. Well, because we've agitated so much in December 1984, um, they've held this thing called the Australia Games for the first time. It came out of the blue. I, um, in December, we are in the gym punching speedballs. We're on our run. So I couldn't run out of sight on a dark night in December. That, you know, I didn't, I, I risked doing a hamstring if I did. But because we were agitated so much and they allowed us, they said to me, you can run in my arms and if you want, or you're, you're in my arms and meters. I said, no, I have to run because I can't not run because I've been agitating so much. And in that race was a guy called um, 
What's his name? Uh, the beer with me, I'll get his name. Oh yeah, Calvin Smith. Calvin Smith was a reigning um, world champion and 100 meter record holder. So they got him over in America for the Australians. So I, I turned up and just seemed to totally out of shape and go to the park. Bloody stands are packed, all my family's there. You know, everyone's here to watch. I'm, I'm in the newspaper, first run as a pro. So on the market said, go, come stone under this last by a long, long way. But absolutely smashed, which I had, which I knew I would. Um, and after the race, all the amateur runners came up and you know, their suspicions were um, confirmed that we couldn't run. So they were very nice. They were saying things like, oh, it's ridiculous, we all should run together. And, you know, we hope this is solved soon, blah, blah, blah. Well, then come March, three months later, we've been doing main training. We ended the Victorian titles. Chris Berry wins 100 metres, and I smashed him in the 200 metres. And all those amateur blokes kept going, they shouldn't be allowed to run. <laughs> <laughs> they really cracked it, which is funny. You know, and it got quite, it got quite nasty. You know, there's a couple of punches thrown on the track, and we had to fight our way. It was a good fun, actually. Um, unfortunately, I had a foot injury um, installed a couple of years before, or well, the last one year before. I, I, I broke my foot in the heat. I had the rage in favour from the heat, and I beat him, but I busted the foot away. And I didn't know it was broken. And I ran with an injection, I got a painkiller put in it, and the semi final comes along. I'm feeling fantastic with a painkiller, but afterwards it was bugging, so it, 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 it was okay. I was in past the six. But after I started running those rubber tracks, it flared up again, um, which is not good, but more than that later. In 1985, in the winter time, um, on the back of our Victorian titles, we were getting four out of standards back, so we couldn't run in a small gift, but we were allowed to run up to Australian level and for good enough international. So we started to focus on the international level. So I began running, I started training twice a day, six days a week, for 50 weeks. Um, I really didn't do much more than just train. So, but I loved it. I, I, I loved training, it didn't hurt me one bit. Um, that's me on the left <coughs> and Chris Perry on the right. Once again, Chris Perry had a, um, little did we know, probably Chris had a bad heart. Uh, he's from, and at, he was 53 years old. In, in 2012, rode his bike home one day on the Yarra River just before the church the bridge. He stops his bike, he gets off his bike and dropped it. Oh, yeah, left his little boy behind, so it was really sad. How a nice bike. Um, so, international competition club comes our way. So, 1986, the Commonwealth Games were going to be in Edinburgh. Now, I hear people say Commonwealth Games is nothing. Well, Commonwealth Games had Ben Johnson, Nathan Christie, and Ben Hunter, and Nathan Farrell said. Yeah, Commonwealth Games in spring is hot. It's not easy to win, it's not easy to make the final. So I set myself in the 200 metres. As I said before, I could run, maintain a top speed for a long way. So I, the, the, the qualifying time for the 200 metres to make the games was 20.9. So I'm all balls down to, try, uh, to uh, a little old meeting in Olympic Park one day in February. It was a raging headwind. It was a hot day. You know, it's February days. It's a massive north wind. So I went down and said, I'm not going to run in time today. And this went, sorry, but I ran 20.7 and I ran half an hour headwind. That was a huge run. In 1986, in March, a few weeks later, a few months later, I ran 20.19. That was an Australian comes record. And that's the run that got me ranked fourth in the world. Um, it was very good news just like here to all over the world. Um, but that run hurt my foot. I went to a surgeon and he found bone chips in the foot. So I didn't run the Australian titles that year. I was in the hospital getting some bone chips removed. Never mind, I went to um, I went to Europe in June. I was feeling a little bit better, still very sore. But I, used, I, I'm not, I, I raced the Grand Prix circuit all over Europe. We used to run against Johnson and bloody Carl Lewis and those fellas. It's, I was, I was asked to run in a thing called the Talbot Games in London. Now, the Talbot Games is, a, is one of the biggest Grand Prix races, and um, you virtually have to be top 10 in the world to get a lane. So I, I ran 200 metres and came second, and Carl Lewis came first. Um, I raced and came friends with Ben, he's a, I'll, I'll talk about him in a way, he's a very, very good bloke. Uh, at the Commonwealth Games, I, I came sixth in the final, which I was disappointed that I should have won it for that moment. Little, that's me. And, uh, 
<laughs> it's six gen Australian titles. Now, oh, we've got a couple of blokes here. This is a, probably a very famous trip. Do you recognise the photo here? Yeah. It's the 88 Soul Olympic final. So, the bloke on the left is Ben. We used to call him Chicken Legs. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, What do you call me that for? But as you can see, Ben's, he was a specimen and a half. And, um, it starts all those all those runs go. He was probably one of the nicest blokes you've ever met. He's a decent, do anything for you, try to help you. Um, he was coached by a guy called Charlie Francis. Um, Ben's mother brought them out to Canada from Trinidad when he was a young bloke, and she used to scrub floors for them. That was her job. Her father, or his father, took off. So Ben was raised by his mother, who worked you know, three or four jobs. When Ben went to Charlie Francis, and Ben's got a bad start, he can't talk. You know, like this. So when he goes to see Charlie Francis, his, his coach, he said, oh, um, I want to run athletics at Charlie has here, whatever, he's a skin like kid. Ben couldn't run a lap. He got halfway around, he stopped. Um, but he kept trying and trying and trying. One day they had a trial and Ben beat some bloke. So Ben, this, this guy came last, Ben came second last. He, he was a joke of the running group. The bloke who came last retired. He said, this bloke can beat me, I'm stuffed, I've got no idea. <laughs> that was the truth, so he retired. But Ben just kept going. But Ben's Coach told him you have to take these things because everyone else is taking them. And there was a lot of arms and as an old journal like steroids. So he was just doing what he was told. Um, and what his coach believed, which is a shame because I still think he's the best I've ever seen. Um bloke next to Ben is Calvin Smith, he was at World Record Holder, I said he came out to Australia. He's probably the only clean black in that race, by the way. Um Leonard Christie on the right for him in the blue shorts. He was, a, he was a hell of a nice bloke too. Um, massive beast of a bloke. Um, and a bloke on the other side is Carl Lewis. Um, do you know, Carl, Carl Lewis is a hell of a good bloke too. He's probably the best uh, best physique of a man I've ever seen. If he walked through in his day, people would stop. Just, you couldn't take your eyes off the bloke. He was just perfectly proportioned. Uh, he won nine Olympic track gold medals in his day and a few silver. Can anyone tell me how many has the Australian team won all time? Track and field gold medal. Have a guess. Uh, it's a uh, in men, men track men, and field. Men's gold medals. Well, in track and field. Ralph DeBell. Herb Elliott. Yeah, Herb Ralph DeBell. Yeah. Edward Flack has only three. Flack, he's, got, he's got nine. Australia's only the one three. So it's he's an impressive uh, individual, Carlos. And you know, one day he, he's a member of this church, and there's a boy in, in Melbourne, not many people know this, who contacted him for the church, he couldn't have cancer. So Carl gets on a plane in Houston, flies over to Melbourne, goes to see the boy, goes to church with him, has a chat to him about life and how to get better, kind of plane went up. Extraordinary, yeah, and, and, and didn't tell anyone about it, it wasn't, wasn't well known. Um, so we're going to have 87, I went to the World Championships over in Rome. Um, I won the uh, Tournament Meta title in Sydney, and um, so what, you know. So I was vice captain of the Australian track and field team. Um, I was running in Dortmund in Germany, we, we used to position ourselves all over here. Um, I won a few Grand Prix meetings over there. Uh, but in Dortmund, I was training one day, and I had a really, really tight hamstring. All of a sudden, out of this old bloke came back, he put his fist right in my hamstring. I reckon he was an ex Nazi, this bloke. He's an SS officer, I reckon he had a tattoo. I'm fairly yeah, aware he was. And so he's, he's put his fist right in here. So I got in the next run, so I tore it. That was it. Me, the me dumped for that years. Wish I'd found who that bloke was, by the way. I didn't mind. So I came back. Um, came back to Australia and then the next year I broke my foot again qualifying for the Seoul Olympics. I had a complete bone graft and screws and things but never the same after that and I was based on Dougie at the age of 29, uh, 28. Um, I just put some good friends of mine here who could run. Gerard Ketting um, on my left there, he's a um, he's Australian champion and record holder. That's me in the middle on the other side is Darren Clark. Darren Clark is um, he's, he's a unique bloke. He, 
it, it, like at the age of 22, Darren being his second Olympic final for the flying and came fourth twice. Um, he could run and run and run. He's a good guy, never worked a day in his life though. I mean, he used to, I used to say, what do you do for a in between training sessions? He said, oh, there's a, there's a priest sitting here and they, they, they go for a walk. So he goes, I climb up the pine up the, up the and try and throw pine cans at him. That's good, Darren. That's, but that's Darren. He's, he's a bit of a, a bit of a lad, a bit, a bit dangerous to hang around, but good fun to hang around too. Um, and finally, school today. It's, um, it's it's totally open now. Like after in '88, we we opened up totally. So all the members of the world come over and they run there. Let me see a Safa Powell, who's a Safa Powell's Jamaican. He's run the second fastest hundred meter ever. He's been there. When you compete at school now, which is a good thing, that the women's school gift and all the prize money is exactly the same. Um, I, I think the numbers is reflected of society now. Like in 1980, when I was running, there was only pros, no areas. There was 39 heats in my year. Now it's totally open, there's only 20 heats. I reckon that's reflected of society. I don't know what it is, but people aren't doing as much um, uh, athletics anymore. And from this year, some clown in the Victorian government decided that no betting was allowed. That's right. Now, I don't know why, because there's some young people around at school. And this is what I think, you know, we're, we're trying to be corralled and, and our behaviours into one lane. I think it's really dangerous what we're doing. This is, you know, those stories I've told, there's a hundred more of them, um, are good. And they're good, for the, uh, they're good for people to do that sort of thing, you know, to not, not to be dishonest, but to actually uh, focus and get on with it and uh, this taking one little thing away. Um, I was in the Hall of Fame in 2013 as well. And now my two sons run, which is good. And in the blue there, the two blues actually, the dark blue is Michael, who's, um, what is he, he's 18 now, and I was 19, and Matt there in the, in the largest thing is uh, 21. So they're, they're both training very hard and they love it. And, uh, interesting, about two years ago, at stall, the front of murder race, they have the front markers 400. For, they, they, they rule the line if you're off a certain mark, you're on the front markers. Now, on the low, that is in the back markers 400. So, on the same day, Michael won the front markers and Matt won the back markers, and that's never been done before, which was a great day. So, we had a good day that day. And that's really it. Well done, Johnny. Um, I'm so happy to take any questions, or if not, I'll just shoot through. <laughs> Chap from Madagascar went Revelo Manazar. Yeah. What happened to him after which we never heard anymore? And he won from scratch. Too. He did, he was an Olympic finalist. Was he? In 68, um, John Lloyd Revelo Manazar. Um, he came back, never ran the school, he only ever ran the school three times. And he won um, off scratch. He um, he went back home. Uh, my friend Peter Marks, a blonde guy in the race, I've, I've, I've had up down in the picture, he, he came second. So Ravello just got him at the end. Um, Ravello died a couple of years ago. I don't know. He, he just looked at Madagascar and just lived his life out. But he didn't have anything to do with athletics after that. He didn't really care much about the sash. He gave the sash to John Tolman. He just could, took the check and took the money around the truth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he didn't understand the issue at all. He just heard about it. And he was a, he ran the International Professional Athletic Circuit in the USA, which is quite lucrative. So that's a good money out of it. Mm. Thank you, I enjoyed that. Could you give me some idea of how the handicap system works? I mean, when you show up there, you say, okay, I've got a, some record as a sprinter. Where do they, do they? Uh, there's, there's handicappers at every meeting and there's stewards and they watch what you do. So if you just turn up. So you have to run some races at stall and then they. No, you can turn up on the day and get what they call the novice mark. So everyone just starts. Unless you're unless you've been like a champion athlete in your day, and I know about it, they'll handicap you hard. But if you just turn up off the street, you'll get the novice mark. And the novice mark is kind of about seven metres. The out mark's yeah. 11, the back mark's scratch, so you're on about seven. Okay. Um, and if you pull up and do funny stuff like that, they catch you. They'll rip your mark down and they'll suspend you for a while too. So that's how I do it. Yeah. In, the, in the days when uh, the amateurs and the professionals 
were strictly separate, mm -hmm. which group made the fastest? Uh, it's very hard to say with the pros because it's handicapped. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, I, I think I think, and the, also the average run on those rubber tracks, and they seem about different faster. I think in sprinting, you say the average probably if you took the best average and the best pro, it's have the best average win. Yeah, because most of those best amateurs are uh, those black guys from America, and they can really run fast. They can't swim, but they can run. <laughs> How do you run fast? How do you run fast? Yeah, is it your size or your muscle or your shape? Oh, there's a, there's a lot of things. I think mean, you, you, um, you need to have the way your foot hits the ground. I think it's a, it's a bit of a gift to the way your foot hits the ground. You need the right um, fast, the amount of fast twitch fibers in your body. Yeah. Um, and then you need to work a lot, do the right training to get there. But you do need a bit of God giving talent. I don't know, no matter what you do, you might run fast. You run the fastest you can. But you won't get to the top now, level. When you're training, how much do you work on your buttocks or your thighs or your calves? They really carry your foot. Yeah. Well, if you look at if you look at um, one of those slides I had up here, um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, this one here. If you look at what's that doing? No, it doesn't matter. Look, if, when, when you run, you notice you're about, you run about this part of the track and your stride length between this foot here and that foot there is nine feet. So you're actually bounding a series of massive bounds. So you're right, you do need a whole bunch of power here and here, particularly out of the blocks. We didn't do it, we never did leg weights. We just did it through um, body weight exercises, so lots of step ups. And just lots of running. I mean, if you do the running training that we did, you get seriously strong in the legs. There's just a lot of development. Some people do it through weights and squats and things, but we didn't do that. Do the guys now have a video clip and then look at exactly what muscle groups are doing what and do the dynamics? They do, yes. Yeah, there's dynamic coaches. We didn't have that. We just um, concentrate. We really, we really just concentrate on our arm action because. You know, if you do the right arm action, your leg will follow. It's not when you're walking. If you do the right arm action, here, your leg will follow. Your two boys are now identical in this style. Yeah, that's due to you. Probably. I've been training them a little bit. They're the same style. You can't put them the same moment. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're um, hopefully I get there too. John, I remember years ago, David David Jones said to me how important the arm action was when you when you're swinging. If you're naturally slow, though, you can improve if you if you're prepared to work on it. You are, yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and really, your wrist should come up to your eye level. Right. Never out there, but up to your eye level. And as you come back, you should see your elbow in line with. Yeah, yeah. And so that, you just practice in front of the um, a mirror. And building strength in your legs as well. Building strength in the legs, yeah, by doing right the right running train. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, what was the prize money in your day? Uh, was it six and a half thousand? Yeah, what's that mean? Um, a brand new Ford Fairlane cost about that. <laughs> Back in that day. Could you comment on footwear for uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I was um, at school, I was uh, this old guy who made handmade Hope Serenity, his name was. People came from all over the world to Hope Serenity. He was an old bloke in um, Colin, John Street Collingwood, and he made spikes, cricket shoes, all that sort of thing from kangaroo leather. And you go to his shop and he put you put your foot on a bit of paper, you trace around it, and then he grab your foot, he'd feel it, and write a few notes. He said, Come back in six weeks. You come back in six weeks and you have the best fitted pair of shoes you'll ever come across. And kangaroo leather. Um, it's very, very light, very strong, and it molds itself around your body, uh, around your foot. So I won, I, I'd use those at store, but after, after I became the Amazon, I used to wear Adidas shoes. And I'd go through a pair of shoes in two weeks for the train, so they only lasted two weeks. So I was sponsored by Adidas, those so getting shoes, which is good. But yeah, a pair of spikes will last me pretty well 10 sessions. 
I'm not in any months, man. Didn't yeah. I'll be fine yeah. in months. Yeah. Yeah, fine, sure. And he was very famous because of the... Yes, he was. He was a good, good man, I think. I didn't have some talk too much, because yeah, one, one of those things... One of those, the black athletes you showed was, was involved in that, I think. No, no, that was John Carlson. That's yeah. it. Yeah, they were, they were 12 years before that. Anyway, sorry, mate. Yeah, thanks. You saw me. I did. Um, two things in my well, I can think of three things, but anyhow. Firstly, the person that Peter was talking about, you said, took the session, the money, and fled. John Louis, yeah. John who? Louis. Louis, L O U S. And then. There was another John. Rello, Rello, Rello was his surname. Yeah, there was another John who was probably active when you were born. Roughly, uh, he was, as far as I know, the one who started off as an amateur. And Ed Stone, and John Stone, Doctor John Stone. Yeah. Oh, why well, not? That's it. Yeah. 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 And um, one that from scratch without any difficulty whatsoever. Yeah. At all. And Rivello, Rivello. Yeah. Yeah. He was very good. Yeah. Stone. Yeah. Right. The two other things. Firstly. Um, the stall gift, is, this is my ignorance here, mm. the stall gift is still run on grass? Yeah. Yes. And is that normal for professional uh, events? Yes, it is. Move to other sorts of no. track? No, good grass so track is a best What's the reason for that? Um, it's run in country towns. Yes. Right? A, lot, a lot of country towns have measures. And country towns don't have um, synthetic tracks. A good grass track is the best track to run on, so mm. I think anyway. Yeah. Yeah, my failing was moving from <laughs> grass onto uh, cinders or whatever they call yeah. them, and I couldn't keep my feet. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to run those things. Yeah. One other thing, you mentioned White City. Yeah. Well, I think if you're in Sydney, you play tennis at White City. In Melbourne, there was a railway station called White City between Tottenham and Sunshine, mm -hmm. much closer to Tottenham. And why was it there? Because there was a Greyhound racing track there. And that's where all of that. Uh, that's where I must have done it. Yeah. yeah. And the, it's no, the, the station's long since gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, what are the long term orthopedic effects on, on people like yourself? Once had a hit done in uh, December. So. What, I, what about your mates? Do they have bone trouble? Um, as I said, Josh McNeil has had, had both done. Um, mostly a lot of knees. Um, some blokes have had arthritic problems in their ankles. Um, the worst ones are those triple jumpers because if you ever get if you ever go to the athletics and they stand near the triple jump track, the way they bang their legs and things on the ground, and they do it a lot when they train, that's putting a lot of stress through. So um, sprinters normally have crook back. So if you look at when you come off the blocks and like I say sit and you take off, there's a lot of force going through your body, through your back. So most, every, every sprinter I know has got a sore back. Yeah. Yes. Johnny, what did you do post-athletics? What, what have you done with your life? Work-wise? Yeah. Um, I've been the Chief Financial Officer on a number of places. Okay. I was a CFO of a place called The Trust Company, which was Australia's largest trustee listed company. So mainly in the finance and administration. Yeah. John, John who, who's the best, best you've seen in Storm? At Storm? Um, probably George McNeil. Yep. Yeah. He was 34 years old when he ran. Um, I saw him run in 79, 1881. He was something special. How would you rank Bill Howard? I didn't meet Bill. Um, Bill Howard, one of the first bloke to run twice. But, I think Bill could have matched it with most. Yeah, been very good. Yeah. Ran his first one, won his first with a broken foot. Oh. And didn't tell anyone because he wanted to come back and win another one with that one. So, yeah. what's, what's the current situation with, say, the 100 metres as far as Australia and the Olympics are concerned? Have we got any up and coming young runners that might, you know? Pretty hard to beat those boys from the West Indies and America. Yeah, we've got that guy in Sydney. Well, like, what's his name? I can't think of his name, you know. But yeah, he, that's right. 
Yeah, it's Brandon. 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 Brandon, yeah, Ron Brandon. He nearly made the final. He's, he's a chance to make an Olympic final. But, I mean, the 100 metre, if you run 10 flat for 100, that's a fantastic race. But it's nowhere near. You know, that's, that's the trouble. And, uh, whereas, if it chose, I mean, you get a white guy's probably more competitive from 200 on. Yeah, but 100 metres is really tough. I'd like 100 metres, I'm not too sure. What's your thought about kids these days at home with their iPads and all that sort of thing and not going outside? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like in my day, there was 39 heads. Now there's 20, and there was just crows back then. There's people back in the old days, like when we were young, you're always out doing something, mm. weren't you? Yeah. You know, never school holidays, you'd shoot through in the morning, come back and ride up at lunchtime and bolt out again. <laughs> and, and, and you'd be always out and about doing things. Um, and, and you do it. Well, I was always playing sport. I used to love to play three hours of football a week in the winter time and then train and train and train. But a lot of kids there, they just don't do it. I mean, my, my two blokes are in athletics. It's fantastic because it keeps them, you know, focused and fit and strong. But a lot of their friends, you know, they're into booze and bloody drugs and other things. It's just not good. And I don't know what to do, you know, because if they've got to focus on our league school, that can be pretty sad. And they're missing out on such good bloody times. I mean, when you're young in your 20s, I mean, you're, you're really bulletproof, aren't you? And you should be out there doing stuff, but uh, sadly they're not. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we'll find out one day, I'm sure. Well, okay. thank you, everyone. guest speakers were a fascinating insight into the world of professional foot running and athletics and what it takes to <coughs> dedication and hard work what it takes to, be, uh, to get to the top of international foot running and such wonderful uh, presentation john thank you so much for your time oh, thanks pleasure. for coming mate thank you and did you say you're a collingwood supporter as well <laughs> even better even better <laughs> <I'm running laughs> even more. Well done. Fun times. You look back on your time back in the seven months. Sorry, just to interrupt before you, you've closed the meeting. Yes. Don't forget that in the news, I've got to send the to check out the members' interest in the Patriots tour. Oh, yeah. That's pretty yes. easy. Oh, yeah. So we probably should do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm not sure I'll have to get that done. You still work for John? We meet across the counter in the bookshop. We're dead, but it's better. Yeah, we're dead, but we're going right. Oh, right.